Thank you again for agreeing to catch up on the notes on your own. I appreciate that. I'm sorry I couldn't get my appointment changed. So we uh, couldn't all wake up bright and early and be at an eight o'clock class. So sorry about that. I uh, hope you guys don't mind too much. Again, thank you for agreeing to do this. I believe when we left off, we were getting ready to talk about the economic expansion of the high middle ages. So we'll start here. Um, I believe we mentioned that the um, most important technology, technology of the high middle ages was actually the development of the three crop system. Now, it's not the kind of technology that we usually think of today, like a tool or a piece of something or software, obviously. But in a way, this was the software of its day. It's not necessarily something that you could walk around and show people, hey, look at this handy dandy piece of technology that I have or anything. But it was very important because splitting the land up into three sections so that crops could be rotated meant that the nutrients in soil were not depleted, which is a huge thing. I mean, I don't know about you. If you farm, then I'm sure you do, but I don't go around thinking about dirt all the time or how rich, how nutrient rich is this dirt? It's probably why I can't grow anything. But um, having nutrient rich soil is very important for agriculture. And if you plant the same thing over and over again in the same land, then you deplete the soil. The worst thing that could happen is what the colonists did when they came to the United States or what would become the United States is they'd plant and when that soil was no longer any good, they'd move a little further and they'd plant again. Eventually you use up all the resources. So this technology was basically splitting a piece of land that you would have normally planted into three sections. You'd use two and let one rest, or you might plant something different in that one so that um, different nutrients could be replenished into the soil. Usually though, it was about letting one third rest while two thirds produced, and it worked. It worked so well that there was an abundance of food, which means that there's enough to trade, there's enough to sell. So markets kind of begin to develop. It really kind of kicks off the development of towns, again, trade altogether. It also helps population increase because people aren't worried about their next meal. The food insecurity is so low. People are also feeling better. They feel like they feel like reproducing. They also have their children living after childbirth. So, you know, because they're born to healthier mothers. So population increased during the high middle ages because of this agricultural revolution. Uh, also, we see during this time period colonization of other lands that um, help spread the agricultural system. So we've got exploring that's going to start around this time period and um, different countries where um, colonists are going to establish lands in which they will plant things like sugarcane and tobacco. Maybe not the best use of an example there. We'll go back to sugarcane. Also probably not a great use of an example. All right, anyway, so I mentioned this really kind of helps trade. It very much um, helps town life, and we'll talk a little about that. But uh, one of the things that trade revival does is um, it gives a market for the goods, the overproduction, especially in agriculture that you've got. But it also brings about some political stability when people are feeling good and when things are going well, there's more political stability. Uh, when things are going bad, people don't like the leaders in charge and they want, they want change, you know? So there's political stability when people are healthy and happy. There's more money in circulation, there are more people and there are international affairs that draw um, like tourism. So we start to see tourism really kind of developing here too. They uh, revive commerce through this tourism. They revive trade through the tourism and they exchange cultures through this tourism. Uh, we also see some business techniques that are starting like banking in general. Uh, the 
early systems of credit start to evolve here, as well as the formulation of some professional commercial rules of business and trade. So I've mentioned towns a couple of times. That's because, as pretty much today, um, our agriculture is based in rural areas and our cities are urban. So, you know, the uh, activities, the stores, that sort of thing, unless you're Dollar General, then you're everywhere. But the um, stores at this particular time are located in cities. So we have lots of people moving to towns. Um, they are growing in trade because of craft guilds and merchant guilds. So these are organizations of craft people, crafts people, and um, merchants who are working together to develop good business practices in these cities. And they start to develop they start to develop so quickly that they form charters to become self-governing. So that's how we have these self-governing cities that come about. They're not part of the manner where the agriculture is taking place. They're part of a city. So um, another important thing about these towns is that they loosen the hold that the landlords have had on the serfs. Chores are in town. If you're a landlord, you don't want to do a chore. You want to do something fun. You want to hunt on your grounds with your friends or something like that. You don't want to go to town and go to the market. So they sent the serfs. And this gives the serfs really their first chance at cultural interaction. So people are starting to have lots of different experiences in this time, which is really important to these serfs who have been landlocked for so long to the Lord that they serve and the people that they serve at their manor. So the towns really for these reasons become basically agents of change and they do start to uh, make changes in the way society operates. We have the rise of some states that I wanna talk about. States, we would call them countries, but at this particular point, um, I think it's fairer to refer to them as states, um, England. England was unified by William the Conqueror in 1066. And in doing this, he kind of fused the government system that was already there, the Anglo-Saxon government systems, along with feudalism. So the manorial society and these Anglo-Saxon systems that were a little different from feudalism, but not much. Um, we see the evolution of law and the development of the Magna Carta to help establish some basic liberties for the English people. And England continues and even expands on the vassalage system of a king asking for input from the nobility and from the higher ups in the social ladder of his manor. Um, not sure if any of you guys like historical fiction or not. There's a great book by Philippa Gregory called The Spanish Queen that was turned into a stars series. And if you watch or read that book, if you watch the series or read the book, you'll see just how much King Henry VIII relied on his advisors. He asked a lot of people um, their input and in things. And so, um, especially with King Henry VIII, a lot of times, you know, you think of him as being a decisive decision maker. And uh, that really, you know, it was part of the custom to seek advice. And so that maintained status quo in England. Louis IX in France, however, goes way the other direction. And instead of continuing that practice in France, he's like, what do I need you for? I'm the king. I'll do what I want. I do what I want. You know, so anyway, um, yeah. In Germany, um, unification or unity, I should say, in Germany is held back. And it's basically between uh, the nobles and the kings and the German king struggle with the Pope. And, you know, it's just, it never really gets off the ground for a grand rise like we see in England and 
to a lesser extent in France. Um, in terms of papal power, because we have the states growing, we also have the power of the popes growing as well. Um, the Benedictine monks of Cluny led the reform movement, the Gregorian reform. And um, this is brought about by a college of cardinals that's used to select popes. The problem that Pope Gregory had with all of this is that he felt like there was too much secular involvement in this process. And by secular, I mean royalty. The king could appoint bishops and cardinals. And in doing so, he was kind of putting uh, representatives of himself into positions of the church. And you can see how that might in a system that's built around loyalty, how that could imply that the cardinal, that a particular king um, appoints, might do things that remain loyal to that king. Um, Pope Gregory thought that that was too much involvement and that it could set the system up to favor a king over a pope. And remember, that power is important. It's important to the church at this particular time. Um, so Pope Gregory insists that bishops be appointed by the Pope. He wants the uh, cardinals to be appointed uh, by the Pope as well, which leads to something called the investiture controversy. And I'm going to include a video for you guys to watch. It's a little short video about it. Um, so take a look at that. This really explains this whole kind of controversy between church and state. Church is in the papacy and state is in, you know, England at this particular point or the government at this particular point. It's the concordat of Worms and that W, I know it looks like Worms, but it's Worms. It's a ger German pronunciation. Uh, the concordat of Verbs was set to kind of resolved this, but it really didn't work. So the struggle actually continued. Again, please be sure to watch that video. Uh, if for some reason your video link is broken in Canvas, here it is for you here as well. You could uh, download the slides and click the link if you'd like. The Pope also grows in power through the Crusades. The fact that the Pope could call the Crusades is huge. Something we don't often talk about. I mean, we think of kings making moves to expand or kings making moves to protect, sending out a military to protect. This is a church. This is a church sending out warriors to take Holy Land back um, and to spread Christianity in the process. So that's powerful. That's a pope being able, that's a church leader being able to start a war. Uh, again, these crusades were set to regain Holy Land from the Muslims. And it was Pope Urban II who called for the first crusade. And this was at 1095 at the Council of Claremont. Um, he used some very persuasive language. I've included a script of a version of his speech. We don't actually have Pope Urban's speech that he used to call for this crusade. We do have though, are several different accounts of literate people who attended this speech and then went home and wrote about it. And thank goodness they did. And if we were to take time to compare several of these, you could see that they're mostly, they're very similar. Um, but the one I selected for you is the one I think used the clearest language and um, is just an easy read in terms of this particular uh, Old English language and such. But um, so be sure to look at that. We'll talk about it next week in class. But, um, you know, we have this warrior aggression. You have people who want to fight. And remember, it's a pretty decent time right now. We talked about political stability. So the fighting is slim. So, you know, he kind of took a, 
a play out of the playbook of the Roman emperors who said, you know, we've got warrior people, we need to entertain them. In this way, though, Pope Urban uses this kind of warrior attitude to actually grow and expand the church uh, property and the church reach. So um, he put part of that part of that warrior aggression to use. Um, the Crusades met stiff Islamic resistance. The Muslim leaders called for holy war, jihad. I want to mention now as we talk about jihad, um, in today's United States, it's hard to hear the word jihad if you're not Muslim and not to think, oh my gosh, you know, what's wrong? You know, it, it brings this really negative connotation. And basically, uh, jihad, according to true Islam, is only to be fought for protection of yourself, your kingdom, yourself, your land, you know. Um, so in this way, it's defense, you know, it's defense of land that they felt like was rightfully theirs, that they had fought and won. So, um Again, it's hard for us to hear that word today and not feel some kind of way about it a lot of times. But um, it's also important to remember that today when we talk about when Islam is in the news, a lot of times it's about Islamic extremist. And we got to keep that word in mind, extremist. It's a really important word um, because... Um, Again, mostly because of 9-11, I think that we have these stereotypes around a particular religion. And I think stereotypes for any group or any people in general can be dangerous because, you know, it's not fair to put everyone into one small box, you know. Um, it's also important to remember that there are all kinds of extremists. There are Islamic extremists. There are Christian extremists. Um, if you were describing me as a Looney Tunes cartoon extremist, you wouldn't be far off. All kinds of extremists out there. So keep that in mind as we're talking about these different religions for the rest of the semester as well. So papal power grows most. It's at its peak during uh, Pope Innocent III's reign. And he reigned from 1198 to 1216. And it's Pope Innocent III who starts to assert papal authority over the princes of Europe with the fear of excommunication. So we had this really close bond between church and state, between the kingdoms and the church. Remember how important it was to Pope Leo to get to crown Charlemagne's or Charlemagne's so that he suddenly has the power to crown a king. So now we have the popes now saying, we also have the power to kick you out. So excommunicate means to kick you out. So um, not only if you do something we don't like, we'll kick you out of the church. How do you think that that would make a king look if he was kicked out of the church in a land where Christianity is kind of the mode of the day. So would not have fared well for any king to have been excommunicated from the church. So you got uh, monarchs walking on eggshells to make sure that the church doesn't kick them out. Um, also important during Pope Innocent III's uh, time period is the Fourth Lateran Council that he convened in order to argue that the Eastern Orthodox Church, which had broken away from um, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, because they broke away from it and started their own from that, the Pope argued that the Eastern Orthodox Church is still subordinate to the Roman Catholic Church. This is about, you know, collecting taxes and that sort of thing. That's why it would have been so important. Um, it also prohibited the state from or the, the clergy from having to pay taxes. 
So, you know, it's, it's kind of building that. And we still have, um, like today, states pay or churches pay a limited amount of taxes um, based on whatever our schedule is, tax schedule is, but we won't get into that too much. One of the other things, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I do want to mention it here, um, is that the Fourth Lateran Council also decreed that the body and the blood of Christ is present in the sacrament of the Eucharist. So if you've ever participated in or seen um, communion at a church, that's what we're talking about. Um, it's generally believed in a, a lot of churches. I'm not going to say most or all because I don't know most or all, but um, that, you know, there is a bread, a wafer, a cracker, some substance like that, that, rep that represents the body of Christ. And then there's a drink, uh, juice, wine, Kool-Aid, whatever it is, um, that represents the blood of Christ. Many churches see that as a representative kind of thing, symbolism. But according to the Fourth Lateran Council, this, um, this decision actually decrees that those items become, they are actually present. It's not just representative. That um, through the miracle, um, the miracle of Christ in general, that uh, these things become what Jesus instructed that they were. So anyway, I wanted to mention that to those of you who are interested in Bible studies. Also, uh, one thing I want to mention, did I skip something? No, okay. Another thing I want to mention is that um, Christianity at this point is not only anti-Islamic, it's anti-Jewish. It's anti-Jewish too. Remember the Jews were very anti-Christian in the beginning. And so now the feeling is mutual. Um, and the Christians are outnumbering the Jews in many areas. So um, the Jews were attacked by Christians, persecuted often, and often with the support of the monarchs and um, other legal systems in charge. They were also denounced for any kind of economic success they had. Um, the Fourth Lateran Council that we just talked about actually barred Jews from holding public office, and they had to wear a badge. Every time I talk about that, I think about Nathaniel Hawthorne's uh, Scarlet Letter, you know, where um, the adulteress had to wear a big red letter A on her dress everywhere she went to let everyone know she was a sinner. So I think about that, you know, they had to wear badges to indicate that they were Jews. Um, everything about Christian art, and um, religious teachings, any kind of literature at the time period depicted Jews as Satan or satanic, which really terrified these Christians. I know we're talking about the time period like, you know, 1200, but even though the church had been around for a while, it was still developing, you know, and the idea that while people are developing and deepening their views on Christianity, now they have this introduction of a group of people as satanic that had to be terrifying, just had to be terrifying. Uh, the Jews, however, maintained their faith and continued on. And they also contributed to uh, the culture of the high middle ages, but it wasn't an easy uh, it wasn't an easy ride for the Jews at that particular point. So that's all I've got for you here that wraps up this section of notes. Please be sure to watch the extra videos that I'm including for you in the module that will kind of explain things better, especially the investor, uh, investiture controversy. And there's one called Friar, Monk, or Jedi that I'd also like for you to watch. Thanks, y'all.